All right, so now let's talk about just some other considerations, some other things you might want to think about when you're building data center fabrics that uh, you might not normally think about. So this will just give you some ideas about that. So let's begin here. Should you single home or dual home your server to the fabric itself? Now, our, our immediate instinct is always to dual home, right? It's always to dual home, particularly to dual home at layer two. And we'll talk about layer two in just a second, but that's our typical thing. Now, normally, however, when you're running microservices, which means the application is designed to support the loss or the failure of a single server being connected to the fabric, no server is a pet, they're all cattle, then it's okay to single home. This is how most hyperscalers are going to run. They're going to run single home. Now, this is not common in virtual machine or bare metal based services. Now, if you are single home, there are some things to think about, right? ISSU is very, very difficult to do. And again, so therefore your application must be able to support switching, moving from one server to another very quickly. Uh, and graceful restart is another problem as well. You can run graceful restart in some of these situations. So in a some some implementations, you'll have the routing stack, and it sits on top of the rib, and then on top of the underneath the rib sits the fib or the forwarding table. And this fib either can be in software and hardware, or it could be both. In this case, sometimes the rib itself. Zebra, for instance, is being modified to support this, will support graceful restart. So you can restart the routing service on top of Zebra and it doesn't blow away your routes. Another thing you can do, of course, is you can dual home your servers. And this is going to be the most common solution that people are going to run into. Now, immediately when you talk about dual homing, a lot of people are going to say, well, you should dual home to two servers and you should run an MLAG in here. You should make these two connected together using a multi-chassis lag or a lag solution of some type. So you have multiple NICs sitting in the server connected to two physically different switches. Now I'm going to say up front that I am not a fan of layer two MLAG or layer two spanning tree at all in my underlay. I'm going to go back to my original concept and say that I am trying to build a layered system in the data center itself so that I can build these larger modules that are flatter and allow me to control complexity in different ways rather than just com controlling complexity through um, the sort of hierarchical network design that, that we're used to. In this case, fine, dual home. Make these IP dual humming, layer three. Then you can run an overlay protocol that makes the layer two dual humming work. This is something that you can do with eVPN. Again, not going to spend a ton of time on this type of concept here because I'm trying to work on other of these sessions where I can talk about eVPN and talk about some of these concepts. Now, of course, another option is just to run a routed dual home, okay? Now, here the question becomes, should, now I have two different control planes, or three potentially, right? I have a controller or an orchestrator, and then I have an overlay, and then I have an underlay. So if I'm going to run a routed dual homed to the server, should I run the overlay out there, the underlay, the overlay control, the controller or orchestrator? What am I actually running when I say I'm running a routed control plane or a routed dual homed out to these devices? I am going to argue I prefer to never ever run my underlay control plane out to these devices. There really is no reason to do this. Now I know that when you talk to people about Rift and other things like that, one of the reasons Rift is designed to scale so large is because people want to run the underlay control plane on their bare metal server. But you have to think about what is it you're gaining. First of all, you only have two connections. You're not going to have this wide fan out down here at this server. So it's either going to choose this path or that path. That's it. That's all you got. Number two, this is probably going to be a quad zero or zero, uh, zero colon colon zero route sitting out here going to this server, right? So I don't have a lot of information on which to base ECMP. 
Now, if I want to choose one path or the other, that is going to be something that's done with traffic steering. And that is something I would argue should not be in your underlay anyway. The underlay can provide the information to allow traffic steering to take place, but the traffic steering itself should happen. The decision about how to build a label stack or whatever you're doing in order to steer traffic should be done over at the orchestration or the overlay, should not be done in the underlay. It's too much complexity for my underlay control plane. I'm trying to manage my complexity by separating it out along these layers, orchestration controller, overlay, underlay. I want to make each layer do a specific set of tasks and reduce their complexity so they only do those things. So another thing that you run into, if you run your underlay control plane out here, is you are actually messing up the clean separation between your underlay and your overlay as two different failure domains. So if you're building these large flat domains where you're not doing a lot of aggregation, you need to control your blast radius or your failure domains in a different way. Having cleanly separated underlays and underlay overlays can help you do that or can actually do that for you. It's another form of abstraction in the network. So that is something to think about is how this failure domain type system works. Now, there are different types of transports you can use in your underlay. For instance, you can use IPv4, IPv6, dual stack, MPLS, SRV6, SR MPLS. So these are just give you some idea of what these different options are and what the advantages and disadvantages of each one might be. There's almost never a right answer in any of these situations. So IPv4. You could, of course, run IPv4. It's very simple. You don't have to run um, dual stack. If you're running an overlay already, you can run v4, v6 in Ethernet or layer 2 in the overlay using VXLAN on top of v4. Now, it's interesting because I'll go back to the statement about not running my underlay off to the host. There are some networks that are single application networks where you do not have an overlay. In those cases, it might make sense to run your underlay out to these hosts. I'm betting no one listening to this particular session has a single use network of this type. Maybe possible. You might build a separate data center fabric just for something like Hadoop. In that case, you may not have the segmentation and layer two overlay requirements, so you may not build an overlay at all. And it might make sense to run your underlay protocol all the way out to the edges. You can also run IPv6 in much the same way, single stack IPv6 that you might run IPv4. You can use VXLAN to carry v4 ethernet and other things on top of it right uh, and of course because you can use link local and slack you can support a fabric with no addresses uh, so uh, most implementations however i will tell you require an ipv4 address for the loopback address on the device as a router id so you still end up having to manage and deal with those v4 addresses and um, you can run dual stack of course i'm not really sure why you would want to if you're running an overlay uh, if you're running an overlay anyway, the overlay is going to support v4, v6, and Ethernet if it's running over a VXLAN or MPLS. So I'm not really sure why you would run dual stack in your underlay. It just seems like um, a lot of complex configurations and stuff. Now, it could be that you could have bare metal servers that only speak v6 and other bare metal servers that only speak v4, and you need your overlay to run all the way out to those servers. And you need to run your overlay control plane, BGP, EVPN, or whatever it is, out to those servers. That's great. That's fine. Um, in that case, you might want to run dual stack, but you need to think about that and what complexity you're driving into the network by doing that sort of thing. MPLS, of course, you can run MPLS in your underlay. Uh, there are companies that are running MPLS anyway. If you're running it in your core, you know, you're already operating MPLS network. It probably is no more complexity for you to run it in your data center, and it might give you some cool capabilities. You wouldn't get any other way. Um, SRV6, of course, SRMPLS, uh, you can also, well, there's a new option out there that's being worked on, SRM6. There are lots of different implementations here. So going back to this layer design, let's look at this from a single path and think about what this looks like. In this network, let's say, uh, this is my five stages. So this is my top of rack. This is my top of rack. This is my spine. This is my spine. And this is my fab. I'm thinking here of a butterfly fabric. I would run IS to IS here, and that would be my underlay. I would not run IS to IS out to these servers, again, unless I really, really need to for some reason. Single-use 
uh, fabric or single application fabric where you don't have an overlay might be a justification for that. So I would run IS to IS here. Now all of this IS to IS I would want to make you know, or Rift. I could run a Rift in these as well. And I want to make this as autonomic as possible. I actually don't want to just automate the configuration. I actually want implementations that get rid of the configuration. I just don't want configuration on these boxes. These are cattle, not pets. I don't want to treat these things as if they're little special devices that need all this configuration and in tender loving care and to be petted every day and fed special food to not give them stomach upset or whatever whatever these are cattle and I want to treat them like cattle okay on top of all this I can run a BGP overlay running EVPN and again I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this because this is really an underlay series that I'm that I'm working on here but I can run this top of rack to top of rack so what my underlay is giving me is it's giving me BGP capability the ability to build BGP peering sessions and it's giving me my tunnel endpoints so that I can build my tunnels it may also be giving my my SR labels particularly for this fab router so I can control pathing through the network but that's what the underlay is giving me the overlay is doing all the complex stuff. It's giving me my policies, my segmentation, my tunneling of layer two stuff. All of that stuff is done up here in my overlay. Now, of course, in some situations, I can extend this overlay by running BGP out to my host. And that's perfectly acceptable. It's perfectly fine to do that. So that allows you to do that sort of thing when you do this layered design I've been talking about. Now let's talk about another little thing here which is external connections. Now when we look at this network, particularly the way most people draw a spine and leaf, is they draw all the spines on the top and all the leaves on the bottom. And then they show all of this stuff connected in here, right? Well, if you draw it that way, you tend to look at this as if it's your network core. This is not a network core. This is the spine of the network. It's a completely different concept. So what happens is you will often find people building what are called collapsed core or collapsed spine, I can't write, designs, right? So they'll collapse external connectivity and all sorts of stuff into this spine layer. This makes sense sometimes because these can be chassis devices, right? So these are big boxes with lots of processor and lots of memory and stuff like that. Now, I would argue against that. I would say that the spine or the fab should be nothing but a dumb packet forwarding engine. There shouldn't be any intelligence in there. So in that case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to suggest that you move your external connections and all of your policy type stuff down into one of your pods in a butterfly or into one of in, or build a sort of um, border leaf in a clove fabric. Now one of the problems with external connectivity I want to talk about is let's say I have two internet connections and I connect those internet connections to these two routers right here. Now what I've done when I do this is that while everybody has a path up to this so it looks like it's nice and balanced in reality, I put a different kind of load on these two devices. They're going to have to have filtering. They have to have all sorts of other stuff that you're shoving on these two devices. That makes those two devices not cattle, they're pets. Now you've blown apart the entire concept of having single skew, very modular, repeatable type stuff when you do this. Another thing you do is you blow up your traffic patterns because now you have all of your external traffic has to go to these two devices. So now we've gone back to a north-south traffic pattern for part of our fabric. Part of the point of a fabric is to convert all the north-south traffic into an east-west traffic pattern so that all ports are equal and all spine devices or fab devices, all fabrics are equal, right? So when you start attaching external connectivity to these spine devices, it's not a core. It's not designed to be used that way. So one last thing to talk about uh, is to think about the problem of grave failures. Now, normally when we think about resilience, one thing we want to do is we want to have a lot of ECMP fan out, which means a lot of devices. So what we do is, let's say that we have um, 2,500, there should be 2,500 2RU 
uh, by 64 by 100 gig boxes with um, 1024 paths tour to tour. So if I start looking at my formula for figuring out mean time between failure, it looks really, 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 really good, right? I can see that I have a mean time between failure for all the paths between two ports at my top of rack switches of about 25 years. That's a long time. It's really awesome. Um, same thing here. I have like 100 years for my paths. I have uh, 25 years for, uh, for enough routers to fail, etc., etc., etc. So it really looks like MTBF. The problem is, is that the law of large numbers eventually takes over and causes you to reverse your MTBF numbers. So what I mean is this. If I have 2,500 routers and they have this whatever MTBF I've assigned them to, I'm going to find that if I back out and figure out how often any particular router should fail in the fabric, any particular router or the entire fabric might fail every 25 years. But any particular router in the network is likely to fail every 87.6 hours. Well, that's a lot different. If I start looking at optical interfaces, I'm going to find that I probably have an optical failure every 5.5 hours. And these types of optical failures can run into what we call gray failures. And gray failures are failures where you can't observe the failure using standard telemetry, and it, but yet it directly impacts application performance. So these types of failures are very important to look for when you're building truly large-scale fabrics. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it here, but it's something to think about. So rate failures can be things like small percentage of packets dropped, like 1% or something like that, potentially across multiple interfaces. It can slow down convergence. Remember I talked about exponential backoff on your convergence timers. Well, if you have a low-grade amount of just things constantly failing, it can cause your exponential timers, backoff timers, to be constantly backed off and slow down convergence when you need it. So you need to think about your telemetry and how you deal with gray failures. Again, not going to spend a lot of time on telemetry here, but telemetry like security, and I'm not spending a lot of time in security here either, is another entire session or another thing to think about. These need to be bolted on, not bolted on, they need to be built in. They need to be part of the original, they need to be overall part of the original. So that is kind of it for this little series that I've done on data center underlays and fabrics. Um, I'll be doing some other things obviously in the future here at Ignition. Uh, you can watch for those later.